My name is Willie Bolin. I study influence, persuasion, and leadership in selling and sales management, and I teach people how to sell. In this podcast, we'll talk to some of the world's top sales leaders and see what we can learn from them. Welcome to the Sales Lab. Every year in November, Florida State University hosts a massive event in Orlando, Florida. For business students, this is a sales role play and case competition, an opportunity to compete and get exposed to job opportunities with some of the world's best sales organizations. For companies, this is an unbelievable recruitment opportunity, bringing several hundred of the nation's best students, all already interested in starting their careers in sales, into one location for you to meet. So if you're a student looking to differentiate yourself and secure your dream job in sales, a marketing or sales professor looking to show off your students and connect them with great opportunities, or a sales manager or recruiter looking to acquire top sales talent, come learn more about the International Collegiate Sales Competition at www.icsc-fsu.com. That's www.icsc-fsu.com. Hello, welcome to part two of our conversation with Laura Hume. Uh, once again, Laura is the talent development lead for the Americas at IBM, expert in talent development. This part of our conversation, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, go a little bit deeper into the issue of self-regulation, talk a little bit about micro habits. I love this part of the conversation, and I hope you get something out of it too. I like that a lot, actually. When, when I do uh, employee assessments for companies, which I do a, a few times a year, depending on uh, whether we're in a global shutdown. Uh, you know, we, we first try to identify the, those variables that are driving performance. And these could be, you know, various background factors, education, age, experience, whatever, uh, along with psychological constructs, skills, whatever, you know, kind of customized for the company. But, you know, we first identify those things that are driving performance. And then, you know, it would be very easy to stop there and say, okay, so these are the things that you need to train your employees on. These are the things you need to focus your development efforts on. Mm -hmm. But then we also have to go and look and say, okay, well, sure, perseverance is driving performance, but all of your salespeople rated themselves and their peers a seven out of seven, you know, the or the average was a 6.6, 6, right? <laughs> right. Uh, it's, it's so close to the top that, you know, this doesn't really seem like there's actually, there's no gap, right? There's no room for improvement. It's important, but everybody's doing it well. So what we're looking for is these things where, okay, this is a driver of performance and only five, 10% of your salespeople are ranking themselves or ranked by their peers, you know, at a, at a high, sufficiently high level. So I like that. And then self-regulation, how do you actually, I, I, th I mean, I think I know you're talking about something like goal orientation and, and learning and performance and things like this. Yes. I, I used to teach a class at UT on this. It was a great program, again, from that same mentor. It was skill, will, and self-regulation. And, and we got lots of, it was interesting. We had all kinds of different students in there. The athletic coaches, because UT uh, is such a powerhouse in athletics that it recruits from everywhere and really gets in some students who are incredibly underprepared for a UT. Um, and, and the coaches found out about this and started throwing kids. It wasn't really study skills, but it was saying, how do you learn? How do you motivate yourself? It was cognitive theory and motivational theory and self-regulation. So I, I think the easiest one, maybe it's just for me, but, you know, weight loss, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, huge, because it, it, most of us have experienced something with wanting to improve ourselves with that, um, either gaining weight or losing weight, and it's difficult. And you can have all the skill, like I could write nutrition books. I have read so many things. I, I really could. So the skill is there. The will, do I want to, do I want to have a healthier, longer life? Do I want to fit into a smaller pair of jeans? I have the will. What is the disconnect? And the disconnect is really in that self-regulation, which to me simply is, do I have a plan? Do I have a plan that I can follow? Some of this is some of the interesting work that's come out around micro habits, which I think is fascinating and really good. Just a quick aside on micro habits. So I, I, my doctor said, Laura, you have to give up coffee, which was horrible for me. I drink a pot of coffee a day. And I, I tie my, take in my pills, you know, all of my supplements and my vitamins, I tie that to my coffee drinking. And I had to give up coffee. And you know what happened? I keep forgetting my pills. <laughs> so it's kind of that micro habits idea too of how do I come up with a structure? How do I come up with a process to help me succeed in this path? And that's the self-regulation part to me. It's not just having this motivational 
um, aspiration and really knowing what my diet should be and my exercise should be. It's having all of the things that go around it to make that process work. Interesting. I like that example a lot. Actually, that 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 resonates with me. How do you actually observe that in your employees? You just, is it are you using the AI type of thing to to track that as well, or oh, not really with succession planning. That would be really interesting. I think it would. Well, honestly, that would be a really interesting problem to throw at some of the really smart engineers. We don't really track that. We track it in, in the company skills and then career progression, and we tie the systems together so that um, one of the things that Jenny uh, Rometty, that the, the former CEO, had said was, "We're going to make this transparent." So career. It, it, I don't know if you've exp- experienced this, but I've been in companies where it was easier to get promoted, to leave the company, work for a year somewhere else, come back, and they'd bring you in at a higher level. Yeah. It was easier than the person and really frustrating for the person. I, I was one of those people remaining, looking at a peer, leaving, and coming back and jumping in position over me who had been working at the company so hard for that year, year and a half in the interim. So infuriating. Mm. But it was hard to understand what's what positions were open. It was just easier to leave because you could find the open positions elsewhere. So she said, we're going to make this totally transparent. Um, So all positions are open. We have both what we have your learning, which is our our learning system and your career, which is not surprisingly the career system, but the career system's open. And what AI does do for us, it says, Laura, here are all your skills because we have inferred them. You have calibrated them. We have your skills. And here are all the jobs where you have skills adjacencies. Because anymore, we're seeing that, you know, it used to be you just climbed up a rung, right? The career paths were really straightforward. I'm going to be an analyst, and then I'm going to be a consultant, and then I'll be a manager all in exactly the same, you know, department. And then I'll be a senior manager, and then I'm going to be the boss. Um, Anymore, though, instead of a ladder, it's more like a lattice where people are moving laterally and going, oh, mm. well, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure you've seen, you know, being a professor that the kids coming into college are really tra- being trained for jobs that are not even available yet because the, the, we're seeing that particularly in uh, technology that new languages are coming out, new programs are coming out. You know, blockchain wasn't a thing a decade ago. Um, so, so how do you get there and how do you navigate your career? Well, you look for what your skills adjacencies are, but do I know those? And would I even think to look over in a different department, even if I had 70% of the skills they're looking for? So AI again can pull all that together and push it out and say, Hey, you have 70% of the skills required for this particular job. And that's not a person coaching me. That's because that's hard to scale and it's hard for the managers to know what all the jobs are if it's outside of their department. But, you know, we can we can do that with AI and machine learning, which I think is like the the new world is awesome for people in talent development. And you mentioned this earlier that this is something that you can do at IBM because it's a huge company. You've got thousands upon thousands of employees. There's a lot of data already there and, and it's and this this works in IBM. So for those listeners that are saying, great. I'm not at IBM. What can they do? Uh, I mean, I love this skill, will, self-regulation, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, sort of breakdown of what you're looking for in terms of hiring and development. But how how can a smaller company apply this? They don't have all the data. They don't have all the employees. They're they're trying to grow. They're trying to build. How do we implement? Yeah. Well, my role is not talent development internal to IBM. It's actually we work with companies to help them and this is not a sales pitch at all, but there are a lot of niche tools that are available, lots of um, applications and programs and, and smaller companies that are helping with that, that will have the learner experience platform that's going to have an internal mobility potential. And they, they are looking at that. I think most of the HR departments are really aware of, of what those companies are. I think some of the things that are frustrating them right now is they may have had some of those tools, and I'm not going to name them because I'm now going to say uh, a bad, bad things about those niche players. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, the, but the problem is they, all, they do what they do really, really well. So if, if I am uh, an internal mobility tool, 
and I can do that adjacency piece, right? Uh, and they're not horribly expensive. I mean, yeah, they're it, it, all of these tools are somewhat expensive, but a company should be able to, you know, look at that and say, hey, there's a good business case here because instead of buying externally, I can promote somebody internally. And not only do they already know the company, not only do they know our processes, but you know, shoot, they would have left because they didn't have feel like they had any career growth. So there's a good business case to be made for that. However, when you string all of those niche players together and you sit them on top of a company's um, human resource information system, their HRIS, like a Workday or an SAP or an Oracle, um, you, you'll find that they don't talk to each other particularly well. And so it's really hard to sort of squeeze out all of the goodness of the tools when the, the entire HR tech stack is not humming along and feeding data all the way through really seamlessly. So it's not feeding the skills data that you get from your talent acquisition part of the company, right? All those skills that you can see in the resume and all of that is not feeding into all of the detailed skills down to the competency level is not feeding into internal mobility or your learning system. And how do you make all of that work? That's, that's where we're seeing clients not maximizing what they can do because, you know, IBM's built some of these tools and frankly, we offer some of those tools. But um, I, I think the, the bigger problem is how do you get the most out of those tool investments to really drive an integrated talent development program i just got really nerdy willie sorry about that no no not at all I'll, I'll, I'll get i'll get nerdy i'll get nerdy no i'm just thinking i mean so and maybe it's just my background being in in kind of uh small offices and and startups with a handful of people and and mm -hmm. things like this but uh you know you're talking about an integrated talent development and i'm and i'm just thinking of all the companies i know that don't even have an unintegrated talent development. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's, it's kind of like, okay, well, what, what's the first step? So imagining I'm a small startup, I've got a, a handful of people in a sales and marketing function. Um, what can I do other than, I mean, am I, am I left to roll the dice and, and take wild guesses or no. uh, what would you recommend for somebody in that situation? Yeah. Um, I, I've been at really big companies and consulting with fortune 500 companies for a long time. Um, however, I sit in Austin, which is sort of startup capital of the universe, uh, now that so everybody from Silicon Valley is moving here, and it is the same problem and the same structure, but different tools, and honestly, more manual tools. The things that AI and machine learning do really well is they allow us to scale. But if you're not there where you need to scale because you don't have 50,000 employees or you don't have 200,000 employees, you need you still need to be thinking about all of those processes but it's likely to be a little bit more manual and then as you grow you'll have to weigh which tools you start to use like you should be using some sort of a learning management system particularly because a lot of the compliance training that almost any once you get to any sort of a size you need to have your employees take uh, need to be recorded so that you have a backtrack to say, yep, they took their sexual harassment training. I am not going to be sued for that. You know, that sounds mm. a little cynical, but there needs to be some sort of a record there that you Absolutely. provided the training that they needed and they took it and they passed it. So, you know, usually a learning management system, some kind of an acquisition system. Those are going to be the first few things, along with some sort of a human resource information system that's tracking the employee data, what they're getting paid and where they're getting staffed and all of that. But all of these people processes, I think you really should be thinking through even with a very small company. And I see that not happening because they're starting with whatever their product is. And I'm, I'm mostly talking these high tech startups because that's what I see around me all the time. But they're starting with a whole bunch of great developers and then they get some salespeople on <laughs> and HR is sort of lagging behind. They're not quite thinking about that because everybody's flat out running all the time. But somebody should be thinking uh, far enough ahead on, okay, products out the door. We've got a small size company now. What do we want to do with our talent? How do we want to grow them? What skills do we want to start seeding now so that they you know, will be still cutting edge in technology? And that's true if you're a tech company or not. I think all companies I'm talking to right now 
are thinking about their IT engineering departments and thinking, how do we get them upskilled significantly faster? IBM, just because we're so heavy tech, started that journey years ago, but all companies are looking at that now. And, you know, what is my process going to be? What is What do I think about performance management? How are we going to do succession planning? They start need to start putting those processes in place across all of those you know, major milestones in an employee life cycle. I have a, a question that might be a, a turn in our path here, but yeah. when it comes to talent development, are salespeople different than other types of employees or do you kind of see the same issues in play? <laughs> well, I am one of those folks. <laughs> I think salespeople are not different in the the basic format. I think the motivations are a little different, and and that's true for a lot of roles. Um, but you know, tend to be more competitive, tend to want to be rewarded more financially. Got into sales for that, but you can adjust that. They also tend to need a little bit more training. So the two places I see the most training uh, required are in sales. Some of it are sales techniques and constantly honing that and honing your soft skills and your communication skills and your writing skills. All of that is like a constant incremental improvement. I'm still trying to improve my stuff and I've been in this field for a long time. So you, you need more there, but you also need new product knowledge. How can I get fluent about products really quickly? How can I be answering, you know, um, um, any kind of resistance from the client? What is my best solution? What are best practices my peers are doing? So there's more of a learning need and there's more of a collaboration need there. And I think uh, our, our sales teams t can fall short on collaboration because that competitive piece kind of gets in the way. I, and the other place where I see it is in help centers because the turnover is so high. You know, it, it's a grind, right? <laughs> That's a job where you're answering customer complaints all day or whatever that is. And, and, and in those call centers, it's just, it has higher attrition than almost any other place in a company. And so you need to have a really good training program, not only so you have great customer service folks, but because you're constantly onboarding and hiring in. That's just kind of the nature of that role. Does that resonate with you on the, the difference in the sales? Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm taking notes here actually, and I'm I'm getting lost in my thoughts, which is why I'm uh, I'm slowing down with my questions. But you're you're giving me a lot to think about, which is good. But maybe I should uh, stop writing down and, and getting lost in my oh, notes. Oh no, here. no, I'm, I'm um, glad because you're the you you know you're really the sales expert. That's what I see from from my window. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, my my first thought was you know looking at something like skill versus will that. Okay, you might you might find a situation where salespeople are possibly higher in will, right? They they want to achieve great things. They want their name emblazoned at the top of the leaderboard, right? They want all of this recognition. But historically, in general, uh, I think maybe there's been a, a skill deficiency in that, right? It's it's this uh, the the spirit is willing, right? Uh, the flesh is weak. I I want to win. I want to succeed. Okay, well, are you willing to do role plays and embarrass yourself? I don't know that. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to look like a fool. It's like, okay, well, I thought you wanted to be better, and and being better might mean you have to look like a fool sometimes, right? Uh -huh. um, you have to try things. You have to put yourself out there. You got to be told no, right? So you know that's kind of where my brain went. Now the self regulation is an interesting thing because even those that have the skill and the will, right? I understand some sales methodologies. I can apply it. I want to win. I want to be successful, but my habits are preventing my success. I want to win, but I also get a text from my buddies at, at four that says, hey, meet us at happy hour in 30 minutes before before the rush. And I am quick to say, yeah, that, that sounds a little bit better than doing a few more calls. Mm -hmm. You know, for, that sounds a little more interesting than filling up my calendar next week. Or, you know, the one that's consistent thorn in my side for my entire life is uh, those mornings, you know? Uh, I I want to you know be this military esque guy who springs up at whatever ungodly hour in the morning and goes for a jog and drinks one cup of coffee and uh, you know has this rigid structure and man I you know my self regulation if I can if I can say it is is sometimes not all that I wish it could be you know yeah. and and I wonder about in terms of salespeople in general these micro habits and this is something that we've received feedback from from the companies that hire from us like IBM uh, at least in the past that you know hey when the kids when the stu I'm sorry <laughs> when the young professionals <laughs> get 
in front of customers, they know how to ask questions. They know how to overcome objections. They get all that stuff. It's the hours of phone calls to set meetings. It's the emails that go ignored. It's the um, making sure that if they're having a great week or if they're having a bad week, that they're engaging in their prospecting or networking or outreach activities. Because if those aren't done consistently, then the pipeline isn't operating in a healthy way. So uh, I'm really, yeah, you've really kind of given me a lot to think about. I like this. And and actually next week in class, we're going to be talking about hiring. And so this is going to, I think we're going to maybe make my students listen to this episode and oh. talk, a, talk a little bit about this, because I think it's a nice way to think about three simple things. Because obviously hiring can be bewilderingly complex, right? I mean, of all the things that you want to measure and assess and consider to make sure you're hiring the right person. We don't have all day. You know, we can't. And, and this is, I guess, where your AI comes in handy, right? Because the AI sort of does have all day. It can compute all this information uh, very easily. Yeah. Whereas, you know, a, a lone person or even a committee or a department, you know, we're, we have to pick and choose the things we can evaluate. You know, we, we're, we're going to have to pick maybe three to five things and focus on those and refine those, right? Uh, use those metrics, use those heuristics for one round of hiring, find out that two of the five were really good and the other three need to get cycled out and replaced with something else. And so, so you're always thinking about ways to bucket those types of variables that you might be looking at in hiring. And so I think there's a very good way to bucket that. And some of that with the self-regulation, I'm, I'm, I'm making some you know, connections here. So I, I think about, again, I'll go back to weight loss. So I'm motivated. I've written down all of my vision statements, right? And I know exactly what I should be eating. But the self-regulation part is, have I made the grocery list? Have mm -hmm. I cleared the pantry out of all of the snack food that my kids are eating? Have I committed on my calendar that I will be walking from, you know, 6 to 6.30 every day? Those are the kind of things, and I'm now I'm applying it over to sales. Like, do you have your list of how many calls you're going to make or how many hours? Like, what is the framework you're giving yourself? Not just, oh, I need to make some calls, but I will continue calling until I have finished this list. Or I will clear my emails every night before I do, you know, what are, what are the kind of those rules, the processes that you put around, which is not motivation and it's not skill, it's all the other stuff that mm -hmm. actually can make you successful. We're gonna stop it right there for now. Please dive into the next episode of the Sales Lab to hear the conclusion of this interview. And by the way, if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe and to rate this podcast on whatever app you use to listen. Also, share this with your colleagues and friends, and let's continue to have a deeper discussion on all things related to selling and sales leadership. See you next time in the Sales Lab.